Hey everyone, let me just start by saying, go Canada, conquer calf. Hope you're all watching. Um, my name is Steve Jordans. I'm a professor of psychology at University of Toronto Scarborough. Um, and you know, there's, there's a lot going on now. Uh, and we're hearing a lot about freedom. Uh, and you know, every now and then I, I bite my tongue about things and every now and then I feel like I just want to present well, the psychological perspective on some of these issues. And, you know, given how this freedom is the, the rallying call of the day, I wanted to kind of talk about the concept of freedom from a psychology perspective and just hopefully help us all think through things um, a little bit as we go through, okay? Now, I've actually entitled this short little thing, Freedom, Freedom, Freedom. If, if you don't know that, famous song by Richie Valens in Woodstock that he just sort of created on the fly. He needed to kill some time on stage. He was just strumming away on his guitar and he started chanting freedom, fist in the air, freedom, and the, the fans love it, right? Everybody loves that. We all kind of um, resonate to that term. Freedom is a, a very desirable, desirable state. And of course, a lot of uh, the history of mankind, we actually see it as a quest to, re to, to achieve some level of freedom. Um, you know, so it's a very important concept in our society. But let's put it in context. So first of all, let's talk about the power of freedom. You know, what is the psychological mojo behind that? And the closest thing we can find in psychology, and it's pretty close, is, is something called self-determination theory by Desi and Ryan. Self-determination theory describes um, the things, the, the, the attributes that make some situation or some context or some idea um, attractive. And basically the notion is somebody will feel motivated to do something, to be part of something, if three needs are met. Um, the competence need we won't talk about so much, but the other two are interesting when we think about this sort of, let's call it the freedom movement that we're hearing out there. So first of all, the notion of autonomy. Um, this is an acknowledgement that we all desire freedom. So the feeling that one has choice and willingness endorsing one's behavior. So I'm doing this because I want to do this. Okay, that's very important. When people feel that way, they're much more motivated to engage in that action. And of course, this is exactly what comes in the conflict, conflict when we have things like vaccine mandates, right? People are, are losing that feeling. They're feeling like it wasn't their choice or it may not be their choice. Uh, and so this threatens their autonomy and it makes them less willing to want to participate. They're really going to have to understand the rationale. Uh, to do it. And that's true for all of us, okay? So none of us like being told what to do. That's a general truth and a fact, okay? We also, by the way, really like feeling connected and belonging to others that are part of that association. So, you know, this is another thing that, that sort of drives this phenomenon, that once we have some people saying, you know, I want to be free of these restrictions or free of this mandate, um, and then they find others who feel that same way, instantly they get this community, right? This relatedness to all these others who feel very strongly, very emotionally strong. Uh, and so this, this you know, makes them feel like, yeah, I'm not the only one. There's all these other people and we're all a community and we are, so it becomes this sort of noble, righteous, you know, rebelliousness that, we, that we're here sometimes um, by the people who are fighting against uh, a lot of the rules and restrictions. So, you know, the first part of this talk is this is completely understandable. Uh, especially at a time when we're all so emotional. We're threatened by this virus. There's a lot of anxiety around. And so these forces of, of uh, autonomy and relatedness, the want to have the control, to want to be part of a community, really strengthens these groups and feeds them. And it makes perfect sense that they would feel the way they do. Um, okay, but now let's take it the next step. So another concept from, from psychology, and this is, you know, the details of this are a little controversial, but it won't be controversial at the level we're going to talk about it. So this is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And the concept of Maslow's hierarchy of needs is that, yes, we all have certain needs, but they're not just all equivalent. Some needs are more important than others. Specifically, if some needs are not met, then that becomes all we think about. So he described this as a pyramid with the needs on the bottom being the, the most critical. Right? And so these are your basic biological or called physiological needs, 
breathing, food, sex, sleep, homeostasis, excretion. You you need to be able to do these things. Also, shelter, warmth, water, you know, etc. Um, if you don't have enough food, for example, that becomes your driving thought. How do I get more food? If you don't have shelter, then you want to try to get you know some sort of shelter, etc. And nothing else matters, right? If you don't have those basic physiological needs, that's where your focus is. But now it's the second level I want to talk about. You have your physiological needs and then you have your security needs, okay? You, we all want to feel, once we have our basic needs met, we want to feel safe and secure as we go about our lives. And this is really where the conflict comes with freedom, okay? That concept of freedom. Um, and especially, you know, as we go up to the third level, we have love and belonging. We want to be part of some society, part of some group, part of some connected group of individuals. We can't have full freedom and also have safety and security, right? Because if we allowed full freedom, well, anybody at any point in time could choose to hit you over the head because they like your Canada shirt and they don't have one and they want it. Um, and so I want your shirt, so I'm going to hit you over the head and take your shirt from you. We don't want to live in that kind of place, right? Where people are free to act in any way they want at any time. Um, some people seem to want to live in that sort of chaos. You know, we, we hear of some people that are pushing for, you know, that kind of crazy world. Um, ultimate freedom, yeah, it doesn't sound like a world I want to live in. So what we generally have done in society is balance freedom with certain important things that help us live with each other. And those all sort of fit around usually the security kind of notion. Um, I'm not a huge Freud fan, but I think this example from Freud is a good example to think about. He made a big uh, issue out of the period in a child's life when they have to learn uh, to, to go to the washroom in the toilet, when they have to do the toilet training. Think about this. This is a nice encapsulated example. Up until that point, that child has been free to excrete its bodily fluids anytime, anywhere it wished. It had full freedom, right? Um, wow, you freedom lovers, do you want that? <laughs> you know, go ahead. No, we learn at some point that if we continue to behave that way, well, we don't learn, we're told, we're, we're forced into this conflict, but let's go there. But if we generally think, you know, imagine now we all did that. We all wore diapers, maybe, and walked around and excreted any time we want. It would be a pretty stinky world out there, right? It wouldn't be a real world we want to live in. And at some point, humans came up with this fantastic invention of the toilet. Let's get all of those excretions away from our society. We don't have to deal with it. It's that smelly, it's yucky, we don't want it. Um, but now we put the child into this conflict situation, right? We allow them complete freedom for a while, but then we suddenly say, you know what? You can't have that. And, and part of that is safety and security. There's germs, uh, a lot of germs associated with excretion. So you are now going to have to learn the sort of tidy approach to excreting bodily fluids. Uh, you have to learn to use the toilet. The child does not like this, right? Um, he, that's that intrinsic need for autonomy and freedom. I want to do what I want to do. But we impress upon the child, slowly, it takes time, that this is the way to be a proper member of society. That all of us do this. It's the right way to be. It's not a big deal. You know, you just have to learn to do it and you'll be happy you did. But there's that point of conflict, right? Freedom versus sort of societal norms. And, and, and society likes these norms because it makes the world a place we can all live in together. Okay, so it's an example of what I call the compromise approach, which is freedom, yes, we want to honor that desire for freedom as long as it does not harm others. So it's, it's, a, it's a bounded freedom. You know, freedom is the luxury uh, that we have to live in a place, especially like Canada, we get a whole lot of freedom, but there are certain things we're not free to do. And, and these um, compromises, as you were, or these places where we don't have complete freedom, they're represented well in our laws and in our holy books. You know, really, if you think of the Ten Commandments, if you like, or anything in the holy book where they're suggesting, you know, there's certain things you should not do. You are not completely free to do whatever you want. You have to inhibit certain behaviors. Thou shalt not murder, steal, etc. Right? I would love to be able to take my Ducati and ride any speed I want on the 401. 
and if you think of that, that's mostly endangering myself, right? Because I'm the, the, the guy on the, on the motorbike who's most likely to die. But I could be endangering others too. I could scare somebody by driving really quickly. They could drive off, drive off the road, hurt a family member. I don't have this, the freedom to do what I want to do if it impacts society in a negative way. Sometimes, by the way, in our laws, we even go this other step. We say you don't have a freedom to do something because it's harmful to you. Those are things like heroin. Now, some libertarians would say we shouldn't prevent people from doing things um, just because they're harmful to them. Uh, but that shows you how close that law will get to that line, right? Uh, and even beyond the line of, of harming others, even harming yourself. So, you know, this pro-social system we live in, and what we mean by pro-social is, is we have a whole bunch of us living together in a small area. In order for that to work, we have to have a basic level of respect for one another. We need mutual co cooperation, and that means our freedoms come second to our security needs. We first have to have these security needs in place. That's why we have laws, you know, and that's why countries where the laws are respected uh, are better places to live, right? Uh, because the laws give us that security and the feeling we can live our lives. Um, and, and then we have the freedom to enjoy over top of that. Okay, so now how does this all connect with the virus? I just want to kind of describe how I think of this. Um, and, and I don't think there's anything controversial in what I'm about to say. Um, but let me just say, you know, I really view right from the outset, I've viewed COVID as a monster. It's, a, it's kind of an invisible monster. You don't see it very well, which makes it tricky. But it's out there um, and it's doing its thing. So what is its thing? You know, for me, it's almost like the alien, the movie Alien, in the sense that it's coming inside of bodies, it's infecting bodies, it's creating its little virus factory inside that, those bodies, filling those bodies with the virus to the point where um, the individual starts expelling the virus through their breathing and such, um, and thereby spreading the seeds of that virus to others where it will then implant. This is how the monster grows and gets stronger, okay? And so we don't like this monster, right? I don't know about you. I want this damn monster gone. I want to engage in behaviors that are going to more likely get this sucker gone. And the best way to do that, from everything I understand, is to starve the monster, right? Keep the bodies out of its way. If it doesn't have bodies to infect, then it cannot grow and it cannot spread. It's a pretty simple concept. Every restriction that we have boils down to getting our bodies the heck out of the way of the monster. Now, part of me thinks, isn't that what you want? Do you really want this virus inhabiting your body and doing its thing inside your body? Um, I certainly don't. Uh, so I'm quite keen on the whole keep your body away from the monster kind of approach. Um, but, you know, that's... When we just think about it, the vaccines are supposed to make it harder for the monster to inhabit the body uh, in the first place. And if it does, to make the whole thing less dramatic, so less of the virus is produced, less is spread. So the vaccine is certainly one approach. The masks are another approach. The distancing is another approach. You know, all of these are about trying to keep bodies away from the monster, trying to keep the monster as weak as possible uh, so that it doesn't overwhelm our health system and such. Now, some people would say, well, this monster isn't so tough anymore. It was, it was tougher with Delta. You're right. It was tougher with Delta. Probably the, the most lucky thing that happened to us was Omicron. Um, the fact that we actually got a highly transmissible but not so, not so uh, virulent uh, variant was really great, potentially. I mean, it may mean that a lot of us are now more immune than we other would, otherwise would be, including the anti-vax crew, you know, many of whom have gotten sick and hopefully have some level of immunity, hopefully, but they came to it the, the difficult way, right? Throwing their bodies in front of the virus, letting it do its thing and hoping it wasn't too bad. And with Omicron, it's not too bad. What's this monster going to morph into? Right? Do we want to play this risky game every time of throwing our bodies in front of the monster, hoping this monster isn't the, a really horrible one? Not me. I want to starve the monster. Um, I understand the concept of starving the monster. Uh, the, 
I don't see any reason not to. Uh, but mostly, you know, my sort of point today is we're seeing these people fighting for freedom and, and they're presenting it in such an honorable kind of light. Um, like they're rebels, like they're the good guys. Those who today are fighting for freedom, what are they fighting for? They're fighting for the right to feed the monster. That's what they're saying. I don't want to keep my body's, uh, body away from the monster anymore. I don't want to make it harder for the monster to inhabit me and spread and do its thing. And yes, I know potentially through me, it will reach other people, some of whom it could even kill, even though it's just Omicron, there's some people it's still killing every day. Um, but you know, I want the freedom to allow that to happen. I want the freedom to allow it to invade my body, to allow it to spread to, to the rest of the population. I'm gonna fight for that freedom. Well, I'm sorry, I'm a proud Canadian. I can't get behind that. Um, I can't get behind that. Okay, so all this to say, when I view freedom from a psychological perspective, um, I really, I can't see the honor in, in this fighting for freedom right now. I just don't see it. Um, the community who's doing so, from my perspective, is focusing on their needs for autonomy and relatedness. They really want freedom. They really want some control. They, they feel a need for control at this time. We all do. We all do. Um, absolutely. And these are our brothers and sisters, by the way sometimes quite literally. So I understand that the autonomy and the relatedness are really important to our mental well-being. We just can't put that ahead of society's need for safety and security. That's bigger. Freedoms come second to safety and security. So their position is psychologically understandable. I get it. I totally get it. I even resonate on some levels. Um, but in the end, we have to be thinking of the community and not the individual. That's how we've got this way. Fighting for freedom to feed the enemy of all of us is just not cool. Okay, I'm gonna leave it there. I, I, you know, I hope I didn't offend anybody. I'm not, I'm not quite gonna leave it there. I am just gonna back up and say, you know, every now and then this is an emotional issue and it can be hard to talk about without our emotions kind of coming into play. Uh, and, and I'm no different than the rest of us in that way. I have some emotional investment in this issue, uh, absolutely. Um, I've been trying to kind of give you a, a, a sense of how to think this through and, and see whatever position you're in and how it kind of fits with, with some of these psychological concepts. I do think we really need to get past this. Um, I, I really think we do. It's, it's, um, it's dividing us. It's dividing us at a time when we have a common enemy and that's the last time we need to be divided. So, you know, if those who need to protest for this freedom, go ahead, do your protests, uh, etc. But at, at the end, we just kind of got to move forward. And moving forward in a democracy means following the will of the people. Um, you know, coming to a, to a sense of what the majority of us think is the, the best path, and then joining together, walking down that path, and getting to the other side of all this. That's all we all want. We all have the same goal in mind. Um, anyway, so I, let, let's keep it there. All right, talk to you later. Bye-bye.